Yeah, um, thanks for the invitation to, you know, speak in this, you know, meeting, um, uh, seminar, organic seminar series. And as Hung mentioned, I'm uh, kind of, my training is, uh, background is in plant pathology, but with emphasis on nem nematode. And I consider myself as a kind of a field nematologist. So not mostly in the lab, but out in the field and working with the growers. So. I just wanted to, you know, share not only, you know, by fumigation work, you know, previous that uh, work that I did, but um, some of the organic, you know, management approaches that can be used uh, for nematode control. And uh, here, one opportunity is, you know, here in in Coachella, where I'm located in Riverside County, you know, coal crop production, uh, brassica, brassicaceous, you know, crop production is huge, and then the residue is, uh, and you know, one opportunity to use as not only as a bifumigant, but also as a you know green manure, which can be uh, used for nutrient or nitrogen contribution, and in the long run or eventually to cut uh, the cost of you know fertilizer as well as you know nematicides because it has bifumigation effects. So, so that research I'm currently doing, but. Uh, um, so let me go ahead and share some of the work that I did before and going forward what I wanted to do. So this beautiful picture is uh, in Coachella Valley, you see Santa Rosa mountain branches at the back and in the foreground is, uh, is a carrot. This is not actually an organic carrot, but just uh, the picture is really nice. So I just wanted to share that. So, you know, I just wanted to start off with, you know, sustainable agriculture, you know, relevant to organic agriculture, what it means. And it, it captures on um, kind of it and encompasses on, you know, not only profit, but also, you know, the human, you know, aspects of people and then also planet. So you can remember it as, you know, sustainable agriculture can be three P's uh, planet. It has to be environmentally friendly. Uh, and then, you know, it is, um, you know, safe for the people to use, and it must be also profitable. So just as an introduction, I really want to quickly mention, bring up this um, uh, Silent Spring, which is um, a book title that, you know, the author is Rachel Carson back in the 1960s, when she was the really um, you know, influential person, I guess, uh, very, you know, an advocate in against the use of, you know, uh, pesticides or chemicals in agroecosystem. And so this was during Green Revolution when, you know, use of increased, you know, use of pesticides, you know, fertilizers. And so I think her background is uh, marine biology. And so she looked at some of the, you know, effects of pesticides. And so she wrote this book and the, the title is Silent Spring. And it was during that summer, the news came out. So here the, the news article title says Silent Spring is now a noisy summer. So it's the time that, you know, it's even went ahead and then gave a, you know, testified in, in the, the, the Senate uh, subcommittee for pesticides on June 4th, 1963 to advocate against the use of pesticides and what it can, what it's, it's, it is done or doing to the environment. So uh, that was the kind of the time that I guess uh, people become realized the non-target effects of pesticides on environment. And so um, around that time that uh, EPA was born, it was December 2nd, 1970 when Richard uh, Nixon was a president. So that's when the EPA uh, was introduced or, you know, came into, uh, you know, existence to regulate the use of pesticides. And so um, just, you know, moving on to, you know, disease uh, control in, in, in plant pathology, we look at, um, you know, three dimensions um, of a disease triangle. So for a disease to occur, it has to be a susceptible host a pathogen must be really strong or they call it virulent. And then the environment must be really favorable or conducive for a disease to occur. 
And so, you know, management wise, as plant pathologists, nematologists, we look kind of work around, if you look at uh, around this triangle to manage the disease, if there's a virulent path, pathogen emergence, we you know, select those, you know, uh, host plants that are, uh, you know, that have natural host resistance, or we breed the host resistance, or we can use that to control. And then we use, you know, some uh, control measures like organic amendments or use of solarization or pesticides to kind of uh, control. So menu or control the environment, make it either unfavorable for the pathogen to occur. So uh, if you uh, look at it, it's it's just working around the triangle to manage diseases, and that includes you know nematodes. Uh, management is just working around the triangle. And so I uh, just wanted to give you, you know, overview of what are the, you know, major plant pathogens that are that cause disease on plants and not only plants, but human beings. But for this case, we'll be talking about plant pathogens. So major pathogen groups include fungi or, or mycets, uh, bacteria, uh, viruses, and nematodes. But for this case, we will be talking about nematodes. So what are nematodes? You know, I know, uh, you know, most of you might not know what nematode is. So I just briefly wanted to explain, um, give a background before I move into the talk. So a nematode is a roundworm that is microscopic, uh, 20 to 25 micrometer wide, and, you know, a few, you know, micrometer, even less than a millimeter in, in length. Um, unlike a segmented worm, it is uh, unsegmented and it is a thread like, or it's like a worm or vermiforms. And when you cut into half, it is bilaterally symmetrical. So you can equally cut into half. Um, like human beings or any other animals, they have um, digestive system, nervous excretory system. They can reproduce both um, asexually and uh, sexually. But unfortunately, they don't have a distinct uh, circulatory system or skeletal system and respiratory system. So you can imagine how the blood, you know, the movement of the nutrients and dissolved oxygen move around the body. Like human being, you know, blood moves uh, nutri dissolved nutrients and oxygen around our body, but nematode doesn't have. So those nutrients, it moves. Uh, in what is called a pseudocilum, which is a space between, it's like an external, between the external body wall. It's like a fluid filled body cavity, there is lung. So that's where the nutrients move. And it, it is, there's a hydrostatic pressure, there's a high pressure that, you know, moves those nutrients from where it enters from the mouth to the rest of the body. And they don't have the secular, uh, respiratory system which you know oxygen is really important because they're aerobic organism meaning that they need oxygen to survive and so uh to get oxygen they the oxygen goes through uh through their cuticle so they the dissolve oxygen from the water it can be absorbed into the system and they don't have the skeleton system but because of the it's high hydrostatic pressure uh it can move, you know, from one to another. So they kind of describe it as they have a hydroskeletal system. So movement of water can, uh, you know, move them to where they, they want to go. So just a two quick facts about nematodes. They are the most abundant, you know, metagoans or animal in the, in the, in the world. And the first nematode, uh, the first animal to be sequenced is nematode back in 1988. So whose genome was sequenced? That was Cynorhabditis elegans. That was the nematode first sequenced. So those are two quick facts about nematodes. So that's kind of what I wanted to share what nematodes are and let's move on to the talk. So nematode um, is, plant parasitic nematode is just one of the, you know, a counterpart of, you know, just in a community. So uh, in a community, you have, you know, plant parasitic nematode in the soil. 
uh, which that is concerning to us agriculture, you know, farmers. And there are also nematodes that feed on fungi. And there are also nematodes that feed on bacteria. And it is fungi and it is the function of fungi and bacteria that decompose the organic matter in the, the agriculture, agroecosystem. And so their abundance, if there's more bacteria or more fungi, uh, that would mean more, fun, more fun, fungal feeding nematodes or bacterial feeding nematodes. And there are other group of nematodes called predators or you know the others also called omnivores. So just their dynamics, you know, or you know, population density, um, abundance can tell us a different sto story, uh, which you know, nematologists they refer to as a soil health indicator. You know, their abundance can tell us what um, how healthy the soil is. And so here is you know, plant parasitic nematode that we are concerned about, but there are fungal feeding nematodes, bacterial feeding nematodes, omnivores nematode, and predatory nematodes. But for now, I will talk about uh, plant parasitic nematodes. So plant parasitic nematodes, they, you have a stylet here, a distinct stylet. That's the one that they use to puncture the plant cell. So this is a plant, and then you see the nematode using its stylet to puncture and then feeding the, attacking the nem, uh, plants. And here is a root node nematode uh, that I color it with a acid fusion and viewed under the microscope. And then if you just wanted to show a quick video of you know, how nematodes can infect. So here is a, uh, a sting nematode infecting the plant. So you see the stylet right there, this is the plant. And then it, it is a nematode just outside. And so you can see just a slight stylet movement right there. And so plant parasitic nematodes are really concerning to us, you know, farmers. And so here you see a tomato that is really healthy, more functional roots, mean more nutrient uptake above ground, plant will be healthy. But here you see um, root galls, which is uh, characteristic of a root node nematode infection which is more high metabolic activity down here. And so those uh, nutrients, uh, food that plants make up in the leaf, which is a factory through photosynthesis, they are all transported down to these metabolic thing or root goals where nematodes feed. And so infection of nematode uh, can you know, divert those nutrients that's supposed to be, or sugars that's supposed to be stored in the storage organs, which can be fruits, or you know tubers, but instead they can divert those, those sugar into this you know gall formation, which is which you know nematodes feed, and so that will result in reduction of yield and obviously the sugar content because all the sugar can be diverted to here. This is a um, cucurbit or you know melon, and then here you see a carrot that is uh, really unmarketable. So here is a plant cell that is infected. And see you, those ovals here, you see those are nuclear. So the infected plant cell can you know, increase in the production of nuclear. So more nuclear uh, production without actually cell division. So that results in the, the gold formation here. You see. And here, this is just a you know, visual you know, contrast comparison of you know, infected and healthy plant. And you know, below ground, more goals you see because all the, the you know, nutrients are diverted down here. You see above ground is really reduced in you know, a biomass compared to healthy plant, more nutrient absorption because of fun functional roots. You see more biomass production, which can result, you know, reflect it on the yield. Um, this is in Coachella Valley. You see this is uh, okra. It's, uh, it's a small crop, a minor crop in the valley, but uh, it's it's really widely grown by you know small growers, and so uh, started working with them. And what I've noticed here is that uh, on okra, okra and uh, coquille, which is uh, nutsets, weed, they kind of work hand in hand. And so here, those you know in those plants that are infected with you know root node nematode, um, they they lose their leaves. And so you can see 
um, because NAPSET is it's um, uh, not it it is not shade tolerant, meaning that they 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 can uh, uh, not toler they cannot you know thrive in the in the shade, but only when there is an open space. And so here, when the nematode infects the plant, uh, all the foliage or leaves fall down, and there's a sufficient sunlight, they can easily take off. So they can work hand in hand to you know damage the crops. And so now moving on to you know management. So just like any other pest and diseases, um, management can be you know a biological you know cultural control, uh, natural you know use of natural host resistance, you know transgenic or genetically modified organism, um, and then use of you know pesticides or chemical or or, or, or integration of you know one or two of a couple of uh, these through IPM approach. But for this talk, you know, uh, organic management, so, you know, anything that is chemical, uh, that's not organic, and of course, GMO. So any other control methods other than those two, um, you know, can be a, an organic approach for managing nematodes in organic system. So, let me quickly jump into some of the case studies, you know, research that I've done, um, you know, relate in, in, in concerning uh, nematodes. And so, you know, here, since I started job uh, one year ago, I quickly, you know, skim through the field and then see that some of the most, you know, uh, common weed hosts of, you know, nematode, root node nematode uh, that I've seen, you know, this is the field that is, follow for uh, I think eight to 12 months, but there's a uh, host, which is a uh, common lamb scorter growing and it's already hosting nematodes. And so that can obviously compromise your um, nematode management. If, if you wanna manage nematode through, you know, um, follow, which is not growing any crop and leave it bare. So nematodes will die, but if there is a weed host growing, it can actually increase the population. And then there's a red pigweed, which is an amaranth, uh, which can also be a good host for root node nematode, which is common uh, here in vegetable uh, production system in, in the low desert. And then we also have uh, common is um, uh, black nightshade, which is a good host for root node nematode. So you wanna make sure that there is no weed, you know, that can serve as a host for your, to, you know, for your crop. I mean, that can be uh, devastating to your cash crop. And so I was out in the field, I think two weeks ago, and this is a paper field in Coachella in Tamil. And then I got a call from a PCA. I went there, uh, there's something looks suspicious. And I went there, there's a, a lamb scorer right here growing. And then I went through that, it's really gold. Um, and then, of, of course, uh, bell pepper is a good host, so they're all, you know, gold. And then I sampled the soil, came back, checked, you know, in 100 cubic centimeter of soil, there is 400 uh, nematodes, uh, which is really, really high to be to cause damage. And so, again, you want to make sure that there's no weed host in your in your field. Um, so. I previously worked with, you know, cover crops with, uh, especially cover crops with uh, uh, biophenical potential or properties with uh, chemical, you know, crops, cover crops that produce, you know, chemicals that can be used as a natural, uh, you know, pesticides. And so I just wanted to share some of the work. So here um, you see sun hemp is, I think, not commonly grown here but back in Hawaii, when I was working there, that's one of the cover crops that I use. And um, France marigold, which contain a chemical called alpha tetanol, and it's only photoactivated, meaning that uh, it doesn't need to be incorporated in the soil. It's just intercrop with your crops. And once the sun hits the foliage or plant, it activates, photoactivates, and then it can release this chemical in the soil and it can kill the nematodes. So I see that a lot here in the valley, in Coachella Valley, a lot of farmers are growing. So you just wanna use that, you know, in, in intercrop with other crops to 
continue to release that chemical that can kill the nematodes. Um, sorghum is another cover crop that can be used. Uh, here they mostly use it as a forage, but it contains the chemical called durin, which when broken down, it releases um, a toxin that can uh, kill the, you know, kind of sterilize the soil. So, you know, it can not only add nutrient, you know, fertilizer, but as, you know, or organic matter, but it releases chemical that can kill the nematodes or soil bone pathogens. Um, I think those group of plants that are close to my heart and I work a lot is uh, brassicaceous or uh, coal crops. So here is uh, uh, oil seed radish and then brown mustard here. So they contain a secondary metabolite a chemical called a glucosinolate, which when broken down, uh, which broken down, sorry. So it releases this chemical here um, called isothiocyanate. So there has to be a water present to release that chemical. And in the process, it, it produces sugar, which is you know, important for um, you know, soil microbial activity. So it can also enhance microbial activity through addition of sugar, but also you know, release that chemical that can sterilize the soil. So glucosinolate is in the, in the cell vacuole of the cell. And then the enzyme called myrosinase is outside. So when you break the tissue, they come into contact to release this chemical. And so here is one of my study back in Hawaii I did. So we grew, you know, oil radish and brown mustard. We incorporate and then see what's the, you know, benefit uh, by fumigase and effect. And so we used, uh, you know, different termination methods, different way of incorporation. The one that we used uh, plastic, either solarization mulch, which is a clear plastic or black plastic, they, you know, both reduce uh, root node nematodes. So you macerate the tissue like that, incorporate in the soil, and then you see uh, they can reduce because this chemical here, is, is volatile, meaning that it can escape into the soil if you don't uh, contain it. So uh, if, if you cover it, you can contain that. And then that's what is seen here, the effect to maximize the nematode control compared to anterior control here, you're reducing that, you know, uh, significantly those, you know, nematode numbers. So I looked at uh, root node and rainfall nematodes, which are common. Uh, in Hawaii. But here, root node nematode is common that can be controlled. And here, I mean, I can see that, you know, incorporating those, you know, brassica, brassica or cold crop re refuse or residue, um, and then covering with black plastic, just, you know, commonly done during the spring crop, like, you know, uh, strawberry and bell peppers or, you know, okra, you can, you, you know, maximize the nematode control with that. And so, not you know, as a nematode ecologist, I not only look at you know plant parasitic nematodes, but as I've shown you earlier, there are nematodes, other nematodes in a community, nematode community. So I look at bacterial feeding nematodes and then fungal feeding nematodes. What are the non-target effects of you know those bifumigation effects of those cover crops? And then you can see those that are suppressed, the root node nematodes, our target nematodes bacterial feeding nematodes are actually increasing. So it's just increasing the nematode, beneficial nematodes. So it's highly, I would say it's kind of more discriminatory in, in suppressing those you know, target nematodes, but not the beneficial nematodes. Now, one reason I can think of is because you know, sugars are released by those chemical uh, uh, organic you know, green manure and more bacterial or, or uh, biological activity like bacterial activity, you know, decomposition and fungal decomposition. So because of those increase in those fungal bacterial decomposition, more bacteria, more fungus, therefore you see more fungal feeding nematodes and bacterial feeding nematodes. That, that, that's the one explanation. Um, and here I wanted to apply some of those, you know, here in the desert, you know, cover crop use is really uh, limited or almost, uh, nothing because of you know limitation of water, but 
here, you know, winter cover crop or winter crop, uh, cold crop production is huge. And then you see here, uh, broccoli here, and then they're all, they just harvest and then they're huge, you know, a ton of um, residue. So um, using this approach, you know, incorporation and then see what are the biofumigation effects and then how much, you know, nutrient uh, can be cut back or fertilizer can be cut back because of their amendment. So here for, you know, cold crops, you can see on average 97 to 102 pounds per acre nitrogen contribution. And, you know, crops like, you know, corn or they can, or let's say pepper, they might, they can need around 240 pounds per acre nitrogen, but you're already contributing that from that refuse. So just cutting back the fertilizer cost is very important to help grow. So that's, that's kind of my uh, future research direction is going here to, to do that. Um, here I'm showing you this picture because, you know, some of the crops, they can be, be a non-host. And so if you are planting a non-host of nematode, you can, you're rotating with a non-host crop, which can be brassica. So you can actually reduce that, you know, um, nematode pressure in the soil apart from, you know, by fumigation effect and, and, you know, addition of, uh, you know, nitrogen. So here again, you know, during spring they use black plastic, and so uh, once those crop, uh, cold crops, are, you know, getting towards the end, you know, incorporation and then assessing what's the biofumigation effects and how much nitrogen is can be cut back is one study as I've said I wanted to do it so it can be done, you know, on on you know uh, strawberry or you know here in this case bell pepper and you know okra. Um, growing cover crops can not only, you know, contribute, you know, nitrogen by fumigation effects, but they can actually stimulate or, uh, the activity of, you know, natural enemies like, you know, uh, nematode trapping fungi, uh, you know, that can colonize, actually trap the nematodes or colonize the eggs or pasturia that can attack nematodes. So, they, they have you know multiple benefits, but again here it's very limited. But I am trying to you know kind of advocate uh, to use cover crops in 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 the in the in the desert. And so uh, moving on to you know one of the studies that a uh, little bit of funding I got from UCIPM looking at you know nematode management. So one idea you know. For, this is the nematode life cycle, root node nematode life cycle. So when they're at the egg states, they can withstand any, you know, control masses. Or if they are, you know, you think, you know, high temperature in the desert can kill, but if they're at the egg states, it's hard to, to control. And so one way to kind of uh, stimulate them to have to be able to be at the most vulnerable stage, which is the juvenile states to be killed, is one way, so I'm looking at that uh, study now. And so um, I'm preparing a root exudate in the lab here. This is tomato plant that is from Home Depot, uh, collected root exudate, uh, root leachate, whatever water that I put and then they come out, I got, I get that and then I can apply in the field uh, and that will uh, stimulate the heads. And in, in literature, they call it a suicidal hedging, so eggs can, uh, heads out thinking that there is um, host plant to feed on, but I'm, I'm, I'm tricking them to heads to kill, kill, to kill them. So if the juveniles or those active worm states are out, they'll be just continue to move around searching for host and then they can deplete the energy reserve they have. So that's kind of uh, the study I'm looking at. So, um, so that will be looking at, um, you know, I'm, I'm including one of the nematicides, which is a uh, 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 magistin from uh, bio innovation or Moron bio innovation. And I'm also looking at a new nematicide that is not registered in California, uh, which is Salibro and those that are commonly used, uh, Nimitz and Vellum. Uh, but I just wanted to share um, this one here. So 
This is yesterday we injected uh, those root exudates and nematodes here. So we used the PTO here and connected to the 50 gallon tank and all injected. So nematode and um, root exudates are all there. So once they are activated, there will be heads and then will be followed by uh, this, you know, uh, synthetic and biological nematicides to see the effect. So that's that's already that study is going on. And so I wanted to show you uh, one study. It's not really uh, organic uh, OMRI product, but this is a uh, um, Salibro. This one here, which is not registered in California, but I'm already doing the work to see whether that can be you know uh, used here. And so. Um, one thing that kind of very interesting with working with this nematicide is uh, unlike the commonly used uh, vellum, you see Salibro doesn't have the non-target effects on, you know, fungal feeding nematodes, the beneficial nematodes, uh, bacterial feeding nematodes, or omnivores. So it's really suppressing our target nematodes. So that's really interesting uh, to see. I think uh, Gary raised a uh, hand. Uh, can I stop and then answer that question? Yes, please, Philip. Sure. Please, Gary, go ahead. I had a question. It was, um, do you consider the climate change in your recommendations? I think I didn't pick up the last bit uh, to change the rec uh, current recommendation of uh, a specific uh, control. Uh, yes, you can you take into consideration climate change in your recommendations. Yes, yes, yes. That 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 would be a you know good. That, that I think that that would be a good uh, one to consider because you know um, use of those black plastic that I showed you, which, which is commonly used here on, you know, bell pepper, strawberry and okra, you know, covering the soil to, to grow. Um, in, in a study recently we did in, in, in collaboration with uh, University of Maryland, it was, we, we see that, um, which is a, and uh, nitrous nit nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, is is commonly in you know high under the the you know plastic plastic culture compared to you know no no plastic. So you know those considerations, those you know can be uh, uh, you know it's it's you know good to you know incorporate consider that as you know towards climate change, you know, effects of utilizing those, you know, um, practices. So, yeah, if, you know, I would like to do that if, if, you know, I have the opportunity to. All right, so one, you know, preparing this talk, I was, I came, it reminds me of uh, the work that previously that I did using, um, vermicompost and so one organic approach to use is using uh, vermicompost which is very important so the the mechanism how they control they can be they can be used to control nematode is through you know release of you know a comp compounds uh can be release of my micro microbial or predatory nematodes or enhancement of their activity and uh, overall increase in the nutrient availability there's more nutrient then even in the presence of you know pests they can really they can tolerate that that pressure so just having that nutrient available and of course release of toxin so that's something that kind of in the pipeline i would like to do uh, going forward uh, for kind of have uh, many uh, control approaches for organic uh, growers So this was the study that we did. And so here is the white bar you see, um, the one that was not you know, cured or not treated with any heat of uh, UV. And so if there's not treated, that means that more uh, microbial activity going on and therefore that can reduce the juveniles of nematode compared to untreated control here. 
So that that's something that can be done, uh, you know, uh, going forward. And application of, you know, uh, vermicomposting can also induce uh, plant resistance, which is already present, which is similar to an activity, you know, done by uh, a chemical, which is a plant activator called Actigard. So when you just spray, it can induce the plant resistance. So just application of uh, vermicomposting can, can do that. And it, it's easy to, um, you know, prepare the vermicompost just in your backyard or just in the shed next to a farm, you can prepare vermicompost tea, uh, you know, fil filter it and you can apply to, you know, not only add nutrients, but induce the natural resistance in plants to control nematodes, which is uh, an organic approach to do so. Um, so my final slide is just not related to uh, nematode control, but because I work with nematodes a lot that, you know, if there is insect pests that are common, uh, you can use uh, natural biological control with using the nematode, uh, entomopathogenic nematode to control. So you can rear that nematode in the in, in your house or in the just backyard and then prepare a solution to control, um, you know, lepidopteran pest, which are uh, diamondback moth, uh, cabbage slopper, um, and other, you know, lepidopteran pests, which are common here. And so that's something that can be, you know, done, you know, in an organic way to, to manage. So I think uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I would like to, if there's any questions we can discuss. Thank you.